Hey there, in today's video we're going to be looking at <clears throat> China during the age of imperialism, um, a time period stretching from the Opium Wars to the beginning of World War II, uh, which is sometimes known as uh, China's century of humiliation because it sees this uh, once great power and future great power uh, weakened and uh, beaten by Europeans uh, over and over again and torn apart by internal struggles. Um, I'm going to try and cover a lot of material uh, pretty briefly. A lot of this stuff is very complicated. And so if you are interested in learning more about uh, any of these things, I recommend uh, looking for other cool YouTube videos or checking out Wikipedia uh, or other sources because uh, there's a ton of info on all of this stuff. Anyway, um, this picture here shows a painting uh, of a scene from the Boxer Rebellion in which American troops, who look a lot like Boy Scouts, uh, are uh, besieging a medieval-style Chinese fortress. And uh, what you see here is just the real clash of technologies. Um, you've got uh, Western troops with like World War I style rifles and gear going up, up, up against walled cities that would have been pretty effective in the Middle Ages, but don't stand a chance against uh, contemporary uh, or modern uh, military firepower. So anyway, let's see how it came to this and how the superpower of China ended up uh, beaten at the hands of Europe and the United States and Japan. <clears throat> All right. So uh, it's important to remember that before the age of imperialism, China was an incredibly powerful state. Um, during this time period, China was ruled by the last of the Chinese dynasties, at least for now, um, and this one is known as the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the Qing Dynasty was founded by nomadic uh, peoples from the region of Manchuria, up here in uh, northeast China, um, and these folks went down and conquered the Chinese heartland, as well as Mongolia and Tibet and some of the Central Asian um, territories in the steppe. So um, anyway, the uh, Qing Dynasty did a whole lot of stuff, and we've already learned about them in previous classes. Uh, but one thing to note during this time period is that the Qing Dynasty is undergoing uh, explosive uh, population growth, partially due to the uh, introduction of new crops made possible by the Columbian Exchange, including sweet potatoes, which were particularly important. You don't need to write that down. Um, However, uh, one result of this super rapid uh, population growth was that uh, the Qing Dynasty was experiencing a lot of internal pressure, and there were a lot of people looking for land to farm, and there wasn't a lot of land to go around. Um, the Qing also were skeptical of trade with the rest of the world, especially with Europeans, um, and for this reason they limited trade to a single port city. Um, down here in southern China known as Canton. And for China, which was the largest uh, state or country in the world at this time, with a population of about 200 million, allowing only a single port was um, a huge restriction on the amount of trade that China could do with the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> also, by restricting trade, it meant that the Qing Dynasty was not receiving as much information about like new goods and new ideas around the rest of the world. And so over the course of uh, the Qing Dynasty from 1600 to 1800, China begins to fall behind other countries technologically, especially Europe, which is advancing very rapidly during this time period. So the first uh, kind of moment where China is clearly falling behind and is starting to get pushed around by Europe is uh, the Opium Wars. Uh, there are two of these, and the first one happens in 1839, and this is kind of the first wake-up call for China that they are going to need to change something big. Um, so uh, how did the Opium Wars start? Well, what was going on is that the British through the British East India Company were trading 
uh, a lot with China. Um, and one of the products that they found sold very well in China was the highly addictive drug opium. And so what the British had begun to do is they were growing opium in their colonies in India and then sending this opium over to China and selling it for a huge profit. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, China did not like the fact that people were starting to become addicted to opium, so China decided to uh, outlaw opium and outlaw the sale of opium. Essentially, they declare a, you know, a sort of uh, pre-modern war on drugs. Uh, so uh, anyway, they send a guy down to Canton, and this guy um, ha goes into the uh, offices and warehouses of the British East India Company, and he seizes something like 30,000 chests of opium and has it all thrown into the ocean, probably getting all of the fish very high. But so um, anyway, 30,000 uh, chests of opium is an incredibly valuable cargo that the Chinese are destroying. And the British East India Company is very unhappy about this. So they go to the British government and tell the British government that the Chinese government has stolen their property and is uh, basically threatening British trade. So the British respond to this by declaring war on China and they send down a squadron of uh, Navy ships. And the very advanced British naval ships, which have steam engines and highly accurate guns, totally blows the Chinese fleet out of the water. It is not even close. Um, and after destroying the Chinese Navy and bombarding a couple cities, the British force the um, the British are able to force the Qing Dynasty to sign a humiliating treaty. Um, this expands the number of ports that Britain is allowed to trade in from one to five. It also gives the British a island off the coast of China, which is going to become a major trading port, and that is the island of Hong Kong. Um, it also forces the Qing Dynasty to lower their tariffs so that way they can. Uh, the British can import goods cheaply, and it forces them to pay a fine of 21 million ounces of silver, which is a lot of silver. Um, as a result of this treaty, other European powers start coming into China and demanding similar treaties for themselves. Um, China is not in a position to resist, and so pretty soon they have given up trading rights to every European power, that is, uh, France, Germany, uh, Britain, uh, the United States, not Europe, I know. Um, and uh, as a result of this, um, and the second opium war, which they also lose, China basically loses control of trade, and opium becomes a major social problem as more and more people within China begin to get addicted to opium. And the basic result of all of this is that China ends up getting divided into uh, something known as spheres of influence. And uh, so a sphere of influence is a territory where a particular government uh, has the ability to trade and basically control that region for its own interests. Um, and they send a whole bunch of products, including opium, and they also send uh, Christian missionaries to try and convert Chinese people to Christianity. Um, and so China is not conquered. It's not overthrown. The British don't set up a Chinese colony. Instead, they set up an informal imp imperial system where they leave the Qing dynasty in power, but uh, basically get to make as much money as they want while allowing the Qing dynasty to deal with all the problems. So, for example, Britain's getting everybody addicted to opium, and it's up to the Qing dynasty to deal with the social issues created by this. Okay, so that's the spheres of influence. So this is the first major blow to China, is that they basically lose control of foreign trade. Next up, China is going to suffer from a major rebellion. Um, remember how I mentioned that the British were bringing in uh, missionaries to try and convert people to Christianity? Well, this has one really weird effect, and this, and that this guy um, named Hong Zhuquang, uh, who becomes basically a cult leader, uh, claims that he is the uh, brother of Jesus. Um, so basically, that he is the brother of Jesus, born on the other side of the world, 
and that he is here to bring about a Christian kingdom in China. Um, this is a popular message, possibly made uh, more popular by the spread of Christian ideas by uh, European missionaries. And this allows him to raise a huge army and following. And uh, this army marches around southern China and eventually manages to capture a number of important Chinese cities, including the major southern capital city of Nanjing, which is um, just a massive city, probably around like 500,000 or a million people. Um, once he controls this area in southern China, which you can see here, he institutes a sort of like new Christian type of regime. He bans alcohol and opium, but he also begins banning traditional Chinese practices, including the um, tradition of foot binding and polygamy. Uh, so it's both kind of anti-Chinese tradition and anti-European, um, which is funny because, you know, they did convert to Christianity, but it's a different type of Christianity than what you'd normally expect. Okay, so um, uh, the, uh, the Taiping rebels controlling this base in the south, seek to overthrow the whole rest of the um, Chinese state, but they uh, fail to do so. Uh, they are eventually defeated by the Qing dynasty, but not before uh, 20 million people die, making this the third deadliest conflict of all time behind only the Mongol conquests and World War II. This is a wildly violent and destructive conflict that goes a long way towards weakening the Qing dynasty um, and uh, setting the stage for all of the other chaos that is to come. And, uh, uh, sorry, those slides are out of order. Uh, but so after the, after the uh, Taiping Rebellion is over and after the Second Opium War, China decides that it's time to try and modernize, that whatever they're doing right now isn't working, and maybe they should try to copy some of the stuff that Europe is doing in order to make themselves more powerful. This is called the self-strengthening movement. Um, or as one Chinese official described it, uh, they wanted to use the barbarians' superior techniques to control the barbarians. And so basically what's going on here is China is going to try and modernize its army, that way it can fight Western powers and control its territory. Um, and their main focus here is in obtaining uh, Western military technology. So new fancy cannons, possibly like machine guns, steamships, rifles, stuff like that. However, this campaign is not going to be very effective because by only focusing on military technology and not focusing on deeper economic or political changes, China is not going to be able to bring about the transformation needed. And basically, um, the reason for this is that modern militaries are expensive and complex, and you cannot really support a modern high-tech military without also having an advanced economy and a highly organized political system, which the Qing dynasty does not have. So basically, all they end up doing is uh, mail ordering a bunch of European technology and then kind of putting together a little model European army um, that is not very powerful, not very well equipped, and um, easily destroyed. And once that is destroyed, there's not going to be anything left to replace it. You can see a picture here of some high-ranking Chinese officials trying to put together some uh, Western European technology um, and doesn't really look like they have a great idea what they're actually doing. So um, the first test of the stealth strengthening movement is going to happen during the Boxer Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion starts in 1899. And at first, it is against the Qing Dynasty and against Europeans. It is started by a bunch of Kung Fu practicing monks. Yes, really who believed that they had invented a new type of kung fu that could deflect bullets and um, basically allow them to defeat European uh, invaders. Uh, this is a powerful movement that's able to draw a lot of people to it. Um, and at first, the Qing dynasty opposes these guys, but then they decide to switch sides. And the Qing dynasty instead joins forces with the rebels in an attempt to destroy the barbarians, a.k.a. Europeans. 
Um, so, uh, in response to this, the European powers send over um, a sort of coalition army. That is, each country, each European country with a sphere of influence sends over part of an army, and they use this coalition army to absolutely crush the rebels. Um, it turns out that the new type of kung fu does not deflect bullets. And uh, then to occupy the major cities of uh, China, including the northern capital city of Beijing. Uh, this is an absolutely crushing blow to the legitimacy of a uh, crushing blow to the legitimacy of the Qing dynasty and demonstrates that they are totally incapable of defending themselves from European powers. The next blow, uh, kind of adding uh, just sort of uh, injury after injury to the Qing dynasty, is uh, the Sino-Japanese War. And uh, this happens when Japan decides to invade into um, Korea and claim Korea for Japan. China uh, objects to this because Korea had always been a Chinese vassal. Um, and so China goes up against Japan and they get completely smacked by Japan as well. Um, and as a result of this, uh, their whole navy is destroyed. Uh, they lose control of Korea and Taiwan, both of which become Chinese colon or Japanese colonies. They are also required to pay 17,600,000 pounds of gold to Japan, which is a absolutely wild sum and um, actually allows for Japan to pay for the entire cost of the war and then some. And once again results in the humiliation of Chinese dynasty and showing that uh, China cannot even go up against other rival Asian powers. So as a result of these continual humiliations and military defeats, the Qing dynasty is going to eventually collapse. I don't want to get into the details of the revolution that overthrows the Qing dynasty, but what I do want to talk, draw attention to is this guy, uh, Sun Yat-sen. He's a Western-educated um, kind of revolutionary leader who wants to see China reinvented as a modern nation-state rather than an old-fashioned multicultural empire. Um, so uh, in 1911-1912, he, along with a bunch of other people, uh, lead a revolution to overthrow the Qing dynasty, which is successful. And then they, he goes on to establish the Republic of China, and he becomes the first president. Um, and he's got a lot of good ideas, but unfortunately, he doesn't have a lot of control over China. In, during the revolution, various groups rose up and basically started doing their own thing. Um, and so while Sun Yat-sen controls some of the major cities, the countryside is largely controlled by um, bandits and warlords who carve out their own little territories. And then also there's a rising communist movement during this time period as well. Um, and so there's kind of a three-way struggle going on between these different groups, warlords, communists, and republic, uh, republicans, led by Sun Yat-sen, when Japan decides to invade again in 1931. So at this point, China is very divided and still pretty weak. And Japan, which is now fully industrialized, invades and quickly takes over Manchuria, uh, the northwestern part of China. And then from there, marches down the coast and begins conquering uh, almost all of China's major cities. This is an incredibly destructive uh, military campaign, and it results in a huge portion of the total number of deaths caused in World War II. Um, uh, historians today put it somewhere around 20 million deaths. Uh, some people have even gone so far as to suggest that the Japanese were committing genocide during this invasion. Uh, the worst atrocity happened uh, in the city of Nanjing, uh, where the Taiping controlled uh, 100 years earlier. Um, and this city, uh, what happened to the city is sometimes referred to as the rape of Nanjing, because the city was absolutely demolished and the people there were uh, killed and imprisoned and tortured and, in some cases, raped. Uh, so anyway, uh, Shanghai faces a similarly destructive end as well. And so ch this is kind of the low point for the Chinese, is they are, they are defeated, their dynasty has collapsed, and it looks like uh, that they are almost on the way to becoming an imperial uh, holding of the, China, or of the uh, Japanese Empire. 
here are some uh, pictures of Japanese war crimes. Here's a baby next to a blown up building. And here is a Japanese soldier about to behead a Chinese prisoner of war. Um, and so that is what happens to China. We're going to look at China's resurgence after World War II, of course, and look at how they've returned to being a major power on the world stage. Uh, but for now, I want you to think about what China did wrong and how their attempts to modernize were very different from Japan's successful attempts to industrialize in the 19th century. All right, cool. Thanks for listening. Bye.